So the children's story is really going to be good today. And so if none of the younger people want to come, I need some volunteers. And don't make me call anybody out. Just come on up. Because I'll do it, you know. So the idea of this is sometimes we think of ourselves a little bit too highly. You know, we get puffed up. I know, I know, it's hard to believe. And so I thought a good example of that was a balloon. And so this is a birthday balloon, but you could have any kind of a balloon. And so the scripture I'm talking about is, it's from Luke 14, 11, For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. And so, you know, everybody, so everybody's played with a balloon sometime. And it doesn't matter whether you're young or old. Because like when the grandkids have a balloon there, the first thing I do when I walk by is, what do you do? No, I don't pop it. Well, no, it's already blown up. I hit it or I kick it. Depends on how flexible I feel that day. Okay? Pardon? I pop them. Pop it. <laughs> so how many of you guys have seen Beauty and the Beast? Either the Disney animation. We went to the uh, theater last night. And it was really fun. And this got like another week, so I'd go. But do you guys remember the guy who's just a little full of himself in it? What his name is? Gerson. Gaston. Gaston. Yeah. And so when I was thinking about this this morning, and we just watched the play last night, I thought, he is the perfect guy who's puffed up with himself, right? Because he's the strongest, he's the best, he killed the biggest deer, all the women love him, all the men want to be like him, blah, 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 right? And so we're, we think about this as I blow up this balloon, we'll see how this works. You afraid it's going to pop or something? <laughs> Can you tie this for me? Maybe. So you give it to the man who pops the balloons. Well, I'm going to make him feel bad if he pops it, plus then he'll have to blow up another one. And, and so the idea of this is we shouldn't become too full up of ourselves. So if you think of Gaston, you don't have to tie it once. We're going to have to bring in a sub here in a minute. Okay, thanks. So if you think of Gaston as being the big puffed up guy, I was trying to think of someone that just was like the opposite of that. And so do you guys remember Oral Horsheiser? This could be my age. He was a pitcher for the Dodgers. He had kind of a short career because he hurt his arm. Um, but he would always give praise to God anytime he was being interviewed. And he just seemed like a nice guy and everything I've read and heard about him. He was, um, and so he had always talked in his press conferences about how much the God meant for him and in his life. And so when he hurt his arm, one of the first questions somebody asked him was, well, where's your God now? And he said, my God's the same place he's always been. Just because I got hurt doesn't change my feeling with him. I just thought that was, I don't know why, but when I was thinking about an example of somebody, that was just the person that came to me. And he hasn't pitched, um, I think I looked it up and he hasn't pitched since 2020. But I just remember him doing that and how much it meant. And, and so what the scripture is about is how careful that you want to be so that you don't become too puffed up. Because you never know when stuff might change. May have own heart. Well, I brought my own pen. <laughs> It just apparently needed to be longer, or the balloon was tougher. And so what I would tell you is think about, you know, when we're doing stuff, are we just doing it for us because we're God stoning it, you know, all puffed up, telling everybody how great we are, or are we doing what God wants us to do because that's who we're following? Let's pray. Father, we're so thankful again that we can come together this day and, and uh, for you to keep us on an even keel and, and not let us become too puffed up or excited about ourselves. Amen. So the scripture I'm going to use today is from Hebrews. It's chapter 13, 1 through 8, and verse 15 and 16. Let brotherly love continue. Do not neglect to show hospitality to strangers, for thereby some have entertained angels unawares. Remember those who are in prison as though in prison with them, and those who are mistreated, since you are also in the body. 
Let marriage be held in honor among all, and let the marriage bed be undefiled. For God will judge the sexually immoral and adulterous. Keep your life free from the love of money, and be content with what you have. For he has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. So we can confidently say the Lord is my helper. I will not fear. What can man do to me? Remember your leaders, those who spoke to you the word of God. Consider the outcome of their way of life and imitate their faith. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. Through him, let us continually offer up a sacrifice of praise to God. That is the fruit of the lips that acknowledge his name. Do not neglect to do good and to share what you have for such sacrifices are pleasing to God. So I called this Do Good. Seemed pretty easy to come up with the title. And so I wanna go through the scripture and some of it's just making sure you recognize the high points. And then the other part is um, to explain some of the background. And so he talks about this love, brotherly love, and should be mutually love, so that we love everybody in faith and kindness. Um, and we want people to be tr treated sympathetically. So if there's someone in our lives that maybe we don't like as much as we do somebody else, find a way to treat them with that same kind of love you would treat your closest friend, your closest family member, that person in your life that means the most to you. Now one of the things it talks about here is hospitality. And so it was common in the Middle East at 2,000 years ago that if you even sort of kind of knew somebody, you met them once, like passing, if they were gonna be in the area, you would invite them to come and stay in your home. And part of that was, inns were viewed as kind of a bad, costly, unsafe place to stay. And Greeks really didn't like paying for money for the inn. And so a couple weeks ago, I talked about Rahab, and she was an innkeeper, so it kind of gives you an idea of even though she ran the inn, she let these guys stay at her house when they were hiding um, from the, from the uh, people of the city. And so part of this was the cost for preachers because they were so expensive and profits that were traveling. But basically hospitality was viewed as something you would invite your family in for. You wouldn't, family or friends. You wouldn't say, oh, go down to the Motel 6 because it's not that far away because it, it just was not viewed as the right thing to do. And so when they're talking about hospitality, it always means you're inviting the people to come in to stay with you in your home. And, you, and whether you knew them a little or a lot, you're gonna treat them like family. We wanna be sympathetic for those in trouble. Now somebody was asking me the other day, I had to tell, I've told you guys this before, but you know you have to take a test to prove you're not crazy to be a pastor. I've passed it twice, okay? just to show the first time wasn't an accident or I didn't sneak by. But part of my issue is I have trouble relating to people that do things that cause themselves to get into trouble. I mean, so if you do X and you do Y and then something bad happens, I'm thinking to myself, and since you did that and that, you would expect something. And so that's not really a good trait for a pastor. And so I have to con continually work on understanding that just because people made bad decisions and something bad happened doesn't mean that we should have sympathy for them or try to help them. We can't just say, well, you got what you deserved because that's not very godlike, very Christ-like. And, and so that's part of what he's saying here. It's no matter how that trouble came upon the person, no matter how they got there, whether it was their own fault, we need to have sympathy towards them in the situation they're in. And so he talks about marriage and the commentary when I was reading Barclay's commentary on this, he said there's some kind of, not discussion so much, but kind of conflict on what that means. Some people think it means some people are better off to never get married because they're just not gonna be able to, to be as moral and uh, affectionate and the kind of person you need to be if you're gonna be married. Um, or the other is, when you are married, you need to be really careful about what you're saying and doing. And so I always remember, so President Carter wasn't my favorite president, but I think he was a really good man then. I think he's a really good man now. 
Um, I don't know why he thought this was a good idea, but he had not been in office very long, and he decided to do an interview for Playboy. I don't know if you guys remember that. And so they asked him if he had always been a moral person, and he said, well, no, because he said, I have, and, and I met his wife one time. She was very pretty, I thought. And I, uh, he was talking about, in his life, he had run into women, and he just thought, this lady is so beautiful. And he said, I had that lust in my heart. And he said, as soon as I could feel it coming up, I thought, this is wrong. And so he got harangued in Playboy because he hadn't really done anything. But as far as he was concerned, he felt like he'd done something wrong because of the way he had thought about or looked at those women. And so I'm going, well, OK, that's, I mean, what he's telling you is it put him in a place where he worried about what he would do going forward. And, and so that's the other part of this. If you're going to be married and you're going to be um, morally honest to your spouse, then you have to be careful you don't get yourself in those situations. Um, I heard Vice President Pence one time say that he never had a meeting with a woman one-on-one -on because -one, he just simply didn't want to put himself in any kind of position where he would be um, tempted to do anything wrong. And so that was one of the ways he did it. And so he didn't say this, but I'm guessing he's probably looked at women or seen women before and he thought, oh, they're just so beautiful or pretty or nice or smart or whatever it was that attracted him to him. And he just decided that was the best way to avoid those situations. He talks about contentment. So in this case, they're kind of talking about free from the love of money. And, and, I, and it seems to me this is a better response. If we have God in our lives, what is there to not be content? We have everything we need. We may want stuff, but most of the time we don't need it. And I think sometimes we get confused about what we want and what we need. And if we've allowed the Lord to come into our lives and lead us and we're following, then what else could we need? What, what other more is there for us in the world? In the last part of this scripture, he talks about leaders. Um, it's been interesting. So some weeks when I, and, and so I've done the scriptures, I told Annie this today, and Jeremy knows, and Anita, but because I'm gonna be gone, I've done the scriptures for the next three weeks because I, I found out this week, this, uh, when we fly back, we thought we were coming back on Wednesday or Thursday that week, we come in Saturday night at 9.30. So I'm hopeful to be here Sunday morning, but I have that scripture done. <laughs> So we'll see how bright and bushy-tailed I am that morning. Um, but I was, it's been interesting. I've heard a lot of conversation about leaders this week. And they were talking about leaders in the world, but I think leaders in general apply to all this. And so real leaders are going to preach the words of Jesus Christ, and they're going to try to lead people to him. Now, I don't think we really lead, lead people there because they have to be open and Jesus has to be um, there, Jesus is always there, but the question is, is whether they're open to it. But I think sometimes we have to nudge people a little bit, get them pointed in the right direction. And, and so real leaders in your lives are going to do that. Uh, real leaders live in faith. So we got a book about going to Oberammergau, and especially when we're in Italy and in Rome, and it's apparently become really, really corrupt. Their last three national leaders were appointed because the person before them got to go to jail, okay, for different things. And so if you have real leaders, then they have a faith that they're going to uphold and they're not going to do those kind of things where they end up in, in prison or jail. Illinois did that with governors. They had two or three governors in a row that ended up in jail, right? Here's my Illinois disciple going, yeah, yeah. And so how does that happen? How do you continue to elect people that, that can't even, not only may not be able to follow Jesus, but they can't even follow the laws of their state that they've raised their hand and pledged to, to follow. And, and so you're looking for those leaders that live in, in faith. And a real leader, if need be, will die to prove that loyalty, to show others how to live. And so I don't know about you guys, but I've had bosses that I didn't care for so much, and I had bosses that I really liked. 
And sometimes I learn more from the ones that were kind of hard to be around than the ones I liked. Because you'd go, yeah, I'm never going to do that. If I ever get to be the boss, I'm never going to do that. But sometimes the way that they bring people together and the way they lead, you would follow them anywhere because you have faith in them. You know that they're a kind person. Often they're going to tell you what their religious background is and you know that they're following God. Now it doesn't mean you're going to be perfect because sometimes you think you're doing the right thing but it turns out not to be the right thing. But the question is, are they trying to do the right thing? And so kind of the, the end of this is real leaders will set and lead a, an example that will be inspiration to others. Now the question is, is it, a good, is it a good lead or a bad lead? And so I told you guys before I love to watch history. Okay? So I was watching one on General Patton the other day. And the, they, there were still a couple guys, this was a few years ago, but there were still a couple people that served under him that were alive. They were pretty elderly, but they talked about the way he could just command a room and you knew that it was going to be okay, that it was going to work out. He didn't promise that no one was going to be killed in the battle or no one was going to be injured in the battle, but you knew that he was really prepared and that no matter what they did, it was going to turn out okay. May not be for you personally, but the overall battle is going to be okay. Now I'm betting that all of you have had somebody in your life that was just like that. That you had confidence that when you were with them or around them and there was some decision being made, for whatever reason, and sometimes it takes time, there's always somebody in the group that just becomes the leader. It's something about them, something in their personality, the way they follow the Lord, they have that ability to not only lead the group in the way they're supposed to be led, but people are willing to follow them. Now those are all the good examples. History's full of people that are bad examples. You can always use Adolf Hitler for a bad example for everything, but for some reason, people became really attracted to him and followed him. We were talking about Revelation a few weeks ago in the evening service, and we were talking about signs of, of the ends of time. And I said, even though I wasn't alive in World War II, I bet as World War II went through and they saw the way that Hitler was leading the people, I bet people were convinced that was the false leader that was going to bring the world to an end, especially with what was going on. Be and I just don't know how people could go down that rabbit hole with him with all the just horrific awful things he did. But people are going, yeah, yeah, let's go. And, and so I don't know how that happens. But what our, our goal is, is to make sure we're following people that are Christ-like, that are being led by God, and not like the balloon that popped, just some person that's in it for them, to see how powerful they can become, how important they can become. I'll do a lot better popping the balloon at New Burlington because now I know you can't just stick it, you have to run it through there. Don't tell them I'm popping the balloon, okay? But, so here's what I think this is really talking about. That at the end of the day, we're supposed to do good. And if what you're doing, you're not sure is good or not, then I would say go back to the Lord and pray to make sure what you're doing is really good can't be just good for you. Doesn't mean it's going to be good for everybody, but you're going to make the best decision you can to bring the most good. And so I like to quote John Wesley whenever I get a chance, and so this is one of those chances. So I looked, I didn't remember all this, so I had to look it up. And so one of the things that he's quoted as, do all the good you can. By all the means you can, all the different ways you can, for as many people as you can, for all the times that you can, and do it for as long as you can. So when I was at uh, Bethel, 
the, uh, I can't remember the lady's name that played the, the organ. She was 92 then. And I saw that she celebrated a birthday like a year ago, so I know she was still with them then. I don't know if she's playing the organ still, but she could play it. Um, so one day, um, I brought something up before the church and asked if, we, if they had any interest in doing this. It was helping African universities, or the Methodist universities in Africa. And nobody was very excited about doing it. Because basically what they were saying is, we're an older congregation, and we've done that stuff before, and we don't want to help anymore because we've done that before. And so she was 92 or 93 then. So she stands up beside the organ, and literally the organ is taller than her because she was not a really tall lady. And she said, I just don't understand why we do this. She said, we have the ability to help. Don't just say we won't do nothing. Let's just do something. And whatever we do is better than nothing. And I went, you say it. I didn't say that out loud, but I was thinking it. And I thought, she is the oldest person in the congregation by far, 10, 10 years at least. And yet she was still willing to help because she thought that's what the Lord was asking her to do. And, and so when I say, you know, do it as long as you can, as far as I know, if she's still with us, she's still doing it today. And so when I've tried to get people to volunteer, I use Moses as my example because the book I have says Moses was 94 when the Lord called him. So if you're not older than 94, I expect you to participate in whatever the church is doing. If you're over 94, you can think about it, but it doesn't mean it's a deal killer, okay? So 94 is the age. And I don't believe anybody in here is older than 94, right? So no age, no age getting off doing stuff just because we've done it before. And that's what this is telling us. Do all the good you can as long as you can because there's no end. And even if you can't physically do stuff, it doesn't mean you can't pray for it. it doesn't mean you can't write people a note and thank them for doing things. It, it, just be open to what God is asking you to do. And when God asks you to do something, I would strongly suggest doing it because if you don't do it then, you'll end up doing it later because he'll just move you around to a different place and get you to do it. So it's just easier to say yes the first time. Amen? Amen. So our next hymn is The Longer I Serve Him. Once the ladies get up here, if you'd please stand and join us. Out into your world, let us be guided and led in all things we say and do. Let us do as much good as we can in your name and let us always follow your word. Amen.